about the situation in Germany. Europe, of course, has a long history of migration. So how does the current crisis compare to earlier movements of people like the upheaval experience during and immediately after the Second World War? And further back across the centuries, the mass migrations that eventually led to the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, with me here is Keith Lowe, a writer and a historian. His latest book, Savage Continent, is a groundbreaking history of the chaos and lawlessness that gripped Europe in the aftermath of the Second World War. And in Oxford, Professor Peter Heather, a historian of late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, currently Professor of Medieval History at King's College London. Thanks to both of you for being here with us uh, on the programme. Keith, to you, first of all, put this current migration crisis in Europe into to in some sort of context in terms of scale compared to the Second World War, first of all. Right. Well, I mean, over the last couple of weeks, I keep hearing this phrase that, uh, you know, this is the worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. And it, that makes me slightly uncomfortable because I, I, I think that people tend to bring the Second World War into things when they want to make you feel scared about something. So to put it in some kind of context, I mean, um, today's crisis is terrible, of course, uh, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to what happened in 1945. I mean, in 1945 we had, in Germany alone, there were six to eight million displaced persons. That, that was people who the, that Germany had taken from other parts of Europe and were used as slave labour in, in, in Germany, and they had to be repatriated after the war. On top of that, you also had people fleeing the, the Red Army and communism and so on, and, and other persecutions. I mean, it's often forgotten that 300,000 Jews fled Eastern Europe after the war. Just very briefly, I mean, I know numbers are not particularly relevant, but if you think that they are estimating around 400,000 this year in this European crisis. If there was a headline figure from post-Second World War, what, in the millions, what is it? Well, uh, it depends who you count. The, 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 probably between 15 and 20 million. So that goes to show how, how big the scale is. It's vastly bigger than anything we're seeing today. Peter, in Oxford, I mean, same question for you in terms of historical context, and of course your expertise goes even further back. I mean, how do you see it? Uh, I very much uh, agree with your, your other guest, in fact. It's a big crisis. Uh, it's a sort of political crisis for uh, European populations, I think, and European politicians. But in terms of uh, global perspectives on migration, uh, it's not that huge, uh, in fact. Uh, you do have these 20 million uh, who were on the move uh, or displaced in 1945, as Keith was saying, but you also have very large numbers shunted around at the end of World War I, and going further back in time, there have been uh, moments like this before. Uh, it's always, I think, it's always political crisis that generates clusters of migrants in these kind of numbers. Economic migration can move lots of people, but in a sort of steady stream or trickle, uh, this kind of clustering effect comes around when there's something political going on. Uh, that's very interesting, given so much of what has been said about economic migrants this time around. Are these the pictures that we were seeing from overnight and uh, the crush of people? Uh, I mean, Keith, the politicians this time around are, are clearly struggling, given what you said about the numbers being so dramatically different to the situation after the Second World War. I mean, why are they struggling so much when they were able to accommodate much greater numbers in the 1940s? Well, I, I mean, the, the political will was really there in the 1940s. I mean, we just suffered this huge cataclysm in the Second World War, and, and, and people knew they had to do something about it, so there was a lot of solidarity at the time. However, you know, it, it wasn't all plain sailing then either. I mean, it took a, a couple of years, really, uh, sort of 1947, 48, for people to really get to grips with the, the refugee crisis then. Peter, I mean, going back to the fall of the, the Roman Empire, I, I mean, all of these phases and the, the, the mass migration, I mean, does it underline that perhaps within all of our DNA there is this, uh, there is almost a, a spirit to, to actually make journeys like this, and also in our makeup, there's perhaps resistance to that feeling that you may have been swamped or you may be engulfed by, by other people? Uh, I think if you go back to the, the story you're putting a lot on today about the, the fines of early hominids in South Africa, you've got it right there. Uh, 
if that story of human evolution, as we're now coming to understand it, is correct, and I don't think there's any reason to doubt it, then hominids originate in one small part of the planet and use the extra brain power and capacity that they generated as part of that evolutionary process then to take over and colonize so many others. And uh, you've got, uh, human beings use various strategies to make their lives better. Uh, we obviously use our brain power to make tools and develop economic structures, but movement into uh, another environment that offers uh, hope and advantages, that's also been uh, deeply hardwired into hominid psyche since, well, I don't know, 3 million BC, whatever date they want to put and on the And I suppose now you've got the addition of uh, modern technology. We see so many of uh, the people actually getting off the boats when they've successfully made the journeys, actually then talking to relatives on mobile phones and telling them how they actually planned the route, how they were successful. So these things are, are changing all the time. But if you go back to the Roman Empire, I mean, in terms of integration, how did they do that? Well, you've got two different kinds of stories, uh, migration stories, uh, in and around the Roman world. Uh, the, the sort of long, slow story of largely economic migration, the, the kind of thing that we've been seeing from Eastern Europe. And that was broadly successfully done. I mean, the Roman Empire lasts for 500 years at its greatest extent. This is a, a colossally long period at the same time frame separating us from the early years of Henry VIII. So, you know, it's an amazing amount of time. Uh, and the Roman Empire was very successful at integrating slowly uh, many groups who came into its borders in search of uh, employment, economic advantage of all kinds. Um, a lot of them, of course, were brought in involuntarily as slaves as well. The second part of the story, though, is the, the way in which populations around the Roman Empire reacted to the uh, basic fact of Roman imperialism. I mean, it wasn't very nice living next to the Roman Empire. Uh, Romans tended to exploit populations for their own purposes. And over that same long time frame, over that kind of 500 years, you see neighboring populations react to Roman imperialism. Roman imperialism as, with by suspicion, organizing I, themselves. Yeah, and with suspicion, which I suppose is again mirrored uh, just now. Uh, Keith, just a, a final thought uh, briefly. Is it possible through history to look at mass migrations and work out if generally they've been a positive thing or negative? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, it, you know, People who were displaced from their, from their homes, and, and, and in the aftermath of the war, you had sort of 15, 20 million of these people. I mean, they, they suffer a trauma, and that trauma continues. I, mean, I don't think it's any surprise that, that Germany today is, is, where, you know, is taking the lead on this, because they have not only a sort of a feeling of you know, a historical responsibility for things in Europe, but they also have a deep cultural memory of what it's like to be a refugee because I mean 11 million German speakers 12 million German speakers were expelled from other countries around Europe in the aftermath of the war because nobody wanted them around so they have a deep memory of this sort of thing which is why I think they're taking the lead today which I suppose why we've talked about it as well just uh, the echoes of history uh, just impacting on today uh, Keith Lowe and Peter Heather thanks to you both for being with us here and discussing that on the program thank you